Uh, good evening, folks. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Joseph Kanak. Um, and he's uh, going to present uh, growing promising new fruit in Southern California, tips and tricks in matching and growing environments. Joe comes from us, comes to us from um, the West LA chapter of CRFG. He collects and grows some of the world's rarest and most exotic fruits. He is a biomedical engineer by training and has a passion for teaching science. Uh, he has been doing this for over 20 years. Doesn't look that old. Uh, after COVID, Joe decided to follow his other passions of growing rare fruit and um, unknown fruit trees. He's traveled to Costa Rica, Guatemala, Colombia, Peru, and extensively throughout Brazil, establishing relationships with local communities to find and collect rare seeds and seedlings that he offers through his online nursery. Happer Joe's. Uh, this evening, Joe is going to tell us how he successfully grows these exotic species in Southern California. So please welcome Joe. And um, let's get on with the show. Hello. Oh, it works. Um, so my name is uh, Joe Kanak. I am from Louisiana and moved out to California about 27 years ago. Um, and I've been a science teacher for, for a long time in the public school sector uh, and then got interested in growing fruits about five years ago on a surfing trip. Um, so I was in Honduras, uh, El Salvador, my guide, you don't want to travel in El Salvador without a guide, um, pulled over to the side of the road and he threw this kind of dragon fruit looking thing and he threw it back to me and it was a cherimoya. And I'm from Louisiana, never heard of a cherimoya before. And took a bite of that and was like, why are we not growing? Why is this like, I've never heard of this fruit before. Um, and that started my, my passion for, for fruits that you don't buy in the supermarket. Um, and it's pretty interesting now because I, I was saying like, we're just at the beginning of this. Um, because I remember a time when you go to the supermarket and there was what, three apples, red, yellow, and green. And now you go and they've got varieties I've never even heard of before. So... My, my whole goal and my wife's um, kind of goal was to, to grow things that you can't buy at the supermarket. So that's kind of where our passion um, started. Uh, and we'll go with the next slide and I'll start talking a little bit um, about myself. So I, my undergrad degree was in engineering, um, biomedical and mechanical, uh, and then decided I wanted to be a school teacher and, and coach football. Uh, so that took me um, on a path for a while uh, for 25 years. And then again, I, I got into fruit growing. Uh, so then after COVID, I uh, got a little disillusioned with teaching and, and the whole teaching and, and online and everything. So that year we decided um, that there might be a way that we could try to start a business. So I started Hapa Joe's Nursery where I would travel. Um, and at that time, seeds from Brazil and South America were extremely expensive. We were talking $100, $200 for a seed of some plants. Um, and before I invested all that money, I wanted to try the fruit. So that's when I started, well, I basically begged and convinced my wife that I could make enough money to go down there and try the fruit, see what we could grow and import the seeds back. And I did that for about a year. Um, and I traveled to the Amazon, Iquitos, I've, I've slept in a place where there are no electricity, uh, where it's flooded for three months of the year um, all along the Amazon, and I have all that on my YouTube videos. Uh, but Brazil is really the mecca of growing fruits. Um, so this past year, unfortunately, the, the, the seedling business um, is not as fruitful as I thought it would be. So I went back to school teaching, uh, but I still have a side business of growing things. Um, and South America is on the opposite schedule. So it's winter. It's come there when it's summer here. It's winter there. So we're just starting to see some of the, the, the new introduction to Brazil stuff. So you'll, you'll start to see stuff on my website uh, as I've made a lot of connections. And on Sunday... For spring break, my wife and I are going down to Brazil, and she's for the first time going to see Brazil with uh, with all my friends that I met down there. But these are all the places that I've traveled to. These are all my favorite fruits. So these are actual GPS locations of uh, places where I've gotten a fruit that I wanted to keep and save. And so this kind of marks a little bit of my travels. So. 
All right, so before I kind of talk a little bit about um, growing, it's it's kind of odd to me that we don't teach any any plant science in middle school or high school. And I'm, I know, because I'm a California science teacher. We don't teach it at all. So when I first started trying to learn about growing things and you, and you go on YouTube, it's the same things being said, like between all of them, but nobody's telling you what you need to know. So what is the living part of a tree? It's really interesting. The only living part of a tree is that green layer. That's it, around the trunk or the stem. And from that green layer, you can regrow roots or you can regrow bark or you can regrow stem, but the center is just dead material, okay? You have a little bit of cells on the inside of the green and a little bit of cells on the outside of the green. The inside of the green is the phloem that brings minerals from the roots up to the leaves. And then to the outside is you bring sugar from the leaves down to the roots. And I'll explain, that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. And if you keep that green thing alive, you keep your tree alive. Okay? Not the leaves. You can cut all the leaves off, tree's still alive. Cut all the roots off, you can regrow roots, tree's still alive. It's that green layer, right? That's what you're attaching when you're grafting. That's what you're looking for. Okay? Go to the next slide. So that's what we're trying to keep alive. If you want to keep a tree alive, you keep that green layer alive. That's what you're keeping alive. So what do leaves do? Well, leaves is do, do only one thing. They trap the sun's energy along with carbon dioxide and water, and they make sugar. And sugar is glucose. Okay, And then they send that down to the roots or to the cambium to make new tissue or to do whatever. But sugar is energy. That's what leaves do. The other thing about leaves is leaves don't heal. So if a leaf starts to pull nutrients and die, it's never gonna get green again. So you can don't look at leaves as an indicator of health because some trees drop all their leaves when they flower or in the winter time. So it's not necessarily an indicator of health. You wanna look at the new leaf growth. New leaf growth will tell you if it's healthy or not, okay? But leaves can't heal. So, the only thing leaves do is they're just solar collectors that make energy. That's it. Okay. They don't breathe in nitrogen. They don't make any. That's it. And then roots, okay, they take the very little nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, very, very little nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and they send it up to the cells to make DNA and all that other stuff. But most of a tree is water and then carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's about 99.99% of what a tree is made out of. So when we talk about fertilizers, you don't need a whole as much as you think you do, okay? But that's all roots do. Now, roots need sugar because they got to go find nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and all the other micronutrients. In order to do, to do that, you need sugar. Sugar gives you energy, okay? Anytime you use sugar, just like humans use sugar, we have to change carbon di or oxygen into carbon dioxide to break those bonds. So we breathe in oxygen, we use sugar, it's called cellular respiration, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Leaves do the opposite. This is why we, we tandem, right? So leaves breathe in carbon dioxide and then they store that sugar. They make the sugar. Without chlorophyll, without that introduction through um, evolution, there would be no life because everything feeds off of that glucose that is stored by a plant's leaves, okay? So if you understand that, that's all you need to do to keep a tree alive. The next slide. So the major component, again, is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It's, there's no nitrogen, phosphorus, those are all trace minerals. Very little is needed, okay? Also, trees are very slow growing um, and the roots are very slow growing. So when we think about how to keep these trees alive, we're not talking about vegetables. We're not trying to go vegetables that grow in a very short season. We want them to flower and fruit within three months. These things are like your lifetime friends. Trees stay around forever and they grow very slowly. I think somebody will ask me, is there anything you can do to make your tree grow faster? Not really, not unless you want to damage your tree. Right? If you put it into overgrow mode, then you're gonna, the cells are not going to be bounded right. You're going to have all kind of infiltration of fungus and all kind of other issues. you got to let a tree do its deal. There's no way to super, super growth fat. Okay? 
We'll go to the next slide. All right, so this is, um, this is probably the most important thing we'll talk about tonight is the soil. And I, like you, was online trying to figure out how to grow trees. And you see the same stuff, fox farms and all this other, none of that works. There was one guy who changed my mind, Gary Matsuoto Laguna Hills Nursery. If you don't know, you need to go there because he's the only dude that has ever, he's the only one that as a scientist made sense to me. Okay, it's, it's the only one. Because as I traveled through all those places, I would dig into the ground and never did I find cocoa core or peat moss or bark or any organic material. Organic, if you put sand over organic material, that organic material is gonna break down within a year. That's what organic material does. So when you're building, um, when you're building a house for tree roots, you have to remember tree roots, they don't move. They grow, but they have to get everything, their house, everything, all the structure has to be from the potting mix. So if you're using cocoa core or peat moss or anything that could break down, and even, even um, Gary, will say, he says he uses, I think, 20% or less. I mean, I bet you if he could get it lighter, he would use less, or cheaper, he would use less. Okay, that's um, because I, would, I don't use any peat moss. I don't use any cocoa core. What I use is inert or sand. I always start with sand because that's what trees grow in, okay? And sand to me as an engineer is the size of the particle. When I was in engineering school and fundamentals of engineering, when you talked about soil, it wasn't like or peat moss. There's no, there's no peat moss in any type of engineering soil or cocoa core, any type of organic material. It's the size of the particles. The size of the particles dictate um, all the properties. So the smaller the size, the more nutrients and the more water will hold. The bigger the size, the, the, the less nutrients and it will hold. So it's just sand, silt, and clay. So you want some type of variety, some type of mix in there. So I always start with sand. And then you can, you can go to the next slide. So then you can experiment with materials using lighter materials. So there are, there are ways that we can engineer a lighter material um, but then it, it's it's money because the, to engineer lighter material, it costs more. Mm. So pumice is probably the heaviest and the cheapest. Um, and then as you go to uh, rice hulls and vermiculite, you're talking about $60 for a, for a big bag. So is it better? No. What you're looking for is structure, stuff that does not break down so that the, when the roots build, that the roots can breathe because roots have to breathe in oxygen in order for them to convert the sugar and breathe out carbon dioxide in order for them to go find nutrients. That's what roots do. So if your roots are suffocated um, by cocoa core or peat moss and is just suffocating your roots, you're, they're gonna die. This is why when people say to me, um, if they give you the advice that you're overwatering, what they're telling you is you're, they don't know what your problem is, but you're overwatering your really bad material. That's all they're telling you. Because I've been in the Amazon where it rains every day and nothing rots there. There's no fungus in the roots there. I grew up in Louisiana where it rains every single afternoon and it seems like all the trees there grow just fine. So to, to, for me to, to have potting mix that you can only water every three days doesn't make sense to me at all. And that, that, that was where I found Gary and, and started to, to think about what, what grows. So I would travel around the world and I would look and I would dig and it's just sand, silt or clay everywhere. It's all the same stuff, different minerals, different base, but basically the same stuff. Since I started growing in that type of material, stuff has not really died and everything has been much, much healthier. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, the other things you do have to control. Okay, so the thing, I brought some um, material here today, some plant seedlings, and I can talk a little bit about the different type of plants that I've found along my travels. Um, but the other things you do have to control is temperature. I think that's the biggest one. Okay, you can't grow durian or mangosteen in Southern California. You just can't. I think at 55 degrees, durian dies. So there's no, you're going to have to set up heaters, and you can, you can engineer it if you've got the money and you want to do that. Um, but it's, to me, it's not worth it, right? But there are some things that are worth it that I do set up. A greenhouse in my backyard increases the temperature 10 to 15 degrees without a heater. 
So in the winter time, it's doable to have a 50 degree. So those, those pretarias that I want to grow, um, some of the cacao that I want to grow, uh, Garcinia that I want to grow, they can grow in those just fine. And I did it this for two, two winters now, and they do fine. The other thing is, is um, I live in El Segundo, so I'm right along the coast, so it's, it never gets hot where I'm at. I think we get maybe a week or two of 80 degrees, and that's it. It's like 75 is it where I'm at. So I need the greenhouse to also add the heat because I like figs. And so the heat really adds, helps me with the figs as well and some of the other things. Because what I was finding when I was growing is everybody was eating figs and mine were just starting. And so I was like, oh, I am, no, no, we got to figure out another way to do that. I'm a science teacher. I can figure this out, right? Um, and then I have some pictures at the end of some of these kind of cheap setups that I have that are less than a hundred bucks for those cheap greenhouses, except they're really cheap. They only last one season. So I'm trying to figure out a, a better way. And then I do try to grow some of the, some of the super rare stuff that I have for my travels. I do grow indoors. So I fully control the climate. It stays between 60 and 85 in there. And I just control everything. So it stays at 75% humidity and everything in there is just super green and just loves life, um, which proves that you can grow under LED lights. All of these things can be grown under, we, the technology for these LED grow lights that are cheap for 50, 60 bucks on Amazon is ridiculous because it, it works now. All right, so where, where did I start? So when I started looking at, so my wife and I were like, if you can buy the fruit at the grocery store or even the Asian market, then, then we were like, well, let's not grow that. Let's try to find some, some other stuff. So like I was telling some people earlier, if you don't know, you don't know. So where do you start? And I was that guy about three years ago. So in this world, the Brazilians really have led the market. So this guy's name is Helton Jose, and I'm, I see him next week. And he, him and another guy, um, Paulo Seri and Marcos uh, Ijardim, they and uh, Diego Teixeira, which is all my good friends now, they, they started about 10, 15 years ago doing what they called species recovery. So in Brazil, they're, they're really chopping down a lot of land for the, um, agri uh, for the um, cattle market. So Brazil will be probably the biggest exporter of beef in, within five years bar none they love meat and so does the world so unfortunately we're cutting down rainforest and mata forest and atlantic forest uh for these cow farms and on one of these expeditions we were walking that by and you can see literally the the bulldozers knocking things down and to the brazilians to them if you buy the land it's your land you can do whatever you want except the birichi palm which is another interesting thing it's protected palm tree that they can't cut down so they leave that up and then so once that takes over, then you just have a monoculture of birchy palm trees. And you see like, it's, it's crazy what's happening. But so Helton has, um, he started this book. He's a collectionado frutas. And he's, if you get into the fruit world, he's the grandfather of it all. He started it all. Um, and he has a farm about two hours outside of Sao Paulo. So he, his area is very much like where we live. It gets about freezing. It touches frost and freezing every year. Uh, in the summer, it gets nice and hot with a lot of mosquitoes. Um, but his area is very similar to, so if you can grow it at Hilton's place, you can grow it here in so Southern California. So I started there. Um, and then if you're into growing things, this is the book you want to get. It's by Harry Lorenzi. It's kind of the Bible of the fruit collectors for Brazil. Frutas no Brazil. That's the fruits of Brazil. And Harry Lorenzi is the guy who wrote this. Uh, he actually started a botanical garden right outside Sao Paulo. And if you're into fruit, and if you ever want to go, that's the place you want to go because they have it. He has it all, and he's all the collections. But if you want to know what to collect, he's this is the book because if you go through it, it'll t it'll give you the flavors and what the uh, the, the locals eat and what um, the people there collect. Okay, so I just kind of followed what the Brazilians collected um, and then tried to bring them back. So that starts with probably the best group to grow in Southern California that we don't know about, and that's the Myrtaceae family. So it's Eugenias, Plinias, Campomenesias, Mercias, um, Guavas are in the, in the same group. But for me, Eugenias are the easiest to grow. They're already here. Suriname cherries are Eugenia family. 
Um, I don't might have Patamba or Patangatuba here. Um, if you if you kind of started the duel and then in the next the the newer stuff that's coming, um, these are the types of fruits that, that you're looking at. Um, so Eugenia Candoliana uh, is a really good one. It's a rainforest plum. Uh, and I have all of these here for you guys. So if, for anything that I have pictures of, I have here. Uh, and then this is Eugenia Boraperiana and then Eugenia um, SP. So in, in, the, in the world of fruit collecting, if we don't know what it is, we, we call it an SP. So we, this one we found in Bahia, Brazil, which is um, about an hour south of Salvador, Brazil, in the little forest. Really, really awesome little yellow fruit, but we nobody could identify it, so we gave it a, a, an SP name. So I brought some SPs of Eugenias that actually taste good, um, because the other hand, there are a lot of Eugenias that don't. So probably in Eugenias, for every one that I collected, I threw back nine, because there were just there there are a lot of them are just really horrible tasting, like either yeah, had that gasoline or yeah that mouth puttering astringency. Um, that you might find. So there's, yeah. So just be careful with the Eugenias. Sometimes they taste good and sometimes they don't. Um, but the ones that are already here, so Suriname cherries are, are very good uh, if you have those already. Uh, Plinia and Merciaria. This is the group that I think, um, so Jabotacaba is the Brazilian national fruit. And it's the one, it's big collectors. Uh, it's huge collector market in Brazil. And it's starting to gain a foothold here. Um, you start to see there are so many different types of jabotacabas and plinias. Um, but if, you, if you're thinking about plinias, they come in really four colors. And the four colors all taste about the same. So if you get one of, one of each color, in the, if you're a fruit guide, then that's all you really need. If you're a collector, good luck. You're about to just jump down a big rabbit hole. Okay, um, but if you're a fruit person, you just need you just need the four, right? So a, a good red one, and the red ones um, fruit the fastest. So Escalarte, um, which I brought here and have um, for sale for really cheap today, um, those are the fastest fruiting. It's a red and a white that have been crossed together to form this one, and it's really really sweet. And these come from Brazil. Um, so that's the uh, Escalartes over here. Uh, if you have a Jabotacaba and you just bought it, you probably have either what we call a Sabara. That's the one. If you have it, that's the only purple one you need. It's just going to take a long time to fruit. Eight to 12 years for a Sabara to fruit. Very slow growing, very ornamental, small leaves, um, but beautiful. Uh, there are some faster fruiting ones that taste as good. Um, Asu Palista is one. Uh, and then I have one that is very good, to easy to grow in Southern California. So it's Plinia SP Grimal. Uh, and that one's very, very easy. Doesn't lose any leaves in the wintertime. It's the only one of all my Jabotacabas that even in any wintertime hasn't lost any leaves. It just kind of just keeps growing, right? And then you have the white ones. Uh, these are kind of the le least flavorful of the Jabotacabas. Uh, they fruit the fastest. Um, so a lot of people are trying to cross them in to try to get uh, the jabotacabas, the fruit faster. And this one is uh, the best tasting of that is called Broncomel or, or one of the Broncomel ones. Are, uh, and then you have the yellow ones. Um, and yellow ones can be hit or miss, and they can also be Merciarias uh, as, as well. So to throw more confusing into it. So Merciarias are kind of like the false jabotacabas, very similar, very ornamental. Um, once, if you're into this collecting, then you'll go down that rabbit hole. Mercy areas will be the next thing you collect after you collect, try to collect all the plenty is. Um, but the yellow ones uh, are the ones that um, can be fruiting from the trunk and they, they're very ornamental. This is the, the one, the picture was on the, 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 the California rare fruits, the, the flyer. So that's a very interesting tasting one. Um, they all taste really good. Uh, there are no bad jabotacabas. Some have less flesh. Some may not be as sweet, but they're all edible. Yeah. Uh, and then the last two groups are uh, campomanesias and sidiums, guavas. Uh, so campomanesias are, this is the, the next introduction, and this is called campomanesia xanthocarpa. It's a very, it has a, so people won't always ask, what does it taste like? Well, campomanesia has a unique flavor. So it has one of those where you say, well, it has campomanesia flavor, and then it's a little bit sweet, and or it could be a little bit sour. 
This one is all sweet with no sour, really good tasting, and it doesn't have a really pungent canned Polynesia flavor. Uh, the Brazilians kind of like that flavor, but if you're new to it, you either it's either you like it or you don't. Um, I kind of grew it kind of grew on me, but uh, it's also one of those that it's an interesting flavor. Is that's all I I don't even know how to describe it. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just new, right? And then guavas in South America, the guavas are soft flesh. So South American guavas have either soft flesh or even like a gelatinous flesh, whereas the Asian ones are more crispy. So if, you, if you're looking for some interesting ones, um, Sidiums, Helton really likes, I'm not a big guava fan, so I don't really collect a lot. But every time I go see Helton, he gives me a couple um, guava, new uh, guavas to try. Um, and then my favorite is Anona. So I'm a big Anona guy. So the Cherimoyas and Atomoyas is what set me down the path and if you go down the Anona path, then you're going to go down the Duguetia path because that's the holy grail. Now, the problem with Duguetias, and that's these guys here. So uh, this one here is a Duguetia. Um, this is a Duguetia. Um, they're kind of the, the weird, strange ones. And the, all the ones that I've tasted have been edible, but it's, they're really, really, really hard to grow. And on top of that, the seeds are really, really, really hard to germinate. So I have Duguetia seeds that I've had for two years. And they might germinate this year, or they might germinate next year. I've had, they are just the weirdest things. Um, so I have Duguetia, like this is Duguetia spixiana. And, it, and it's really weird. They will all germinate at the same time every year. Like in February, I'll have spixiana seeds, even from like two years ago. They just, it's the weirdest thing. But the problem with Duguetias, as opposed to Anonas, is that they won't ripen. As far as I, I know, there's no rules in botany for sure, but they don't ripen off the tree. So you, there won't ever be commercially available. So if you want to have a Duguetia, you're going to have to grow it yourself. And you won't be able to ship it. You won't be able to, if you want it, you have to grow it yourself. So that's why it's kind of the, the rabbit hole for me. And these are the ones that I collect. And I try to collect, even if they don't taste good, because... I'm sure the first Cherimori didn't taste all that great either. The first, you know, you start to select the flavors, you know, like the first corn was like this big and then they start to select, right? So I'm thinking maybe down the line, we can have a new fruit. But Duguetias is one that it doesn't ripen off the tree and they're ridiculously hard to grow. So if you find seeds online, um, they're almost, almost always not viable. They have to be fresh and they can't become, they can't dry out. They're just, they're just, a nightmare to grow. But along those lines, if you do get them to grow, um, I think it's going to be well worth it. And that's, that's the holy grail for me. Um, that's the kind of the path beyond the cherimoyas. So if you like cherimoyas and atomoyas, you also can look at Anona reticulatas. That's the uh, custard apple. Um, those, are, those grow well here. And then the next one is alamas. I had um, alamas are really, really good if you haven't had those. Alam. Uh, used to be called diversifolia. Now it's macro profilata, anona micro. Um, those are really, really good as well. Uh, and I had those in Guatemala. Um, still trying to figure out how to grow those, um, but they are starting to fruit. I know in Florida they have them fruiting here, and I think in Southern California, I think I saw a couple of guys had them fruiting as well. And then the other group that um, I think is is a good group to grow is Sapotaceae. So. Um, Puterias, like the canistel. There was one that was really, really, really interesting uh, that was in my travels, and this was in Marignal when we were up there. And it's these little orange guys right here. Um, and it's just like a little canistel, but when we bit into it, I swear it tasted like our, like banana Laffy Taffy. And I could not believe what I was tasting. And so if you do your research, artificial banana used to be in nature. It used to be the Gros Michel uh, banana, which is now almost extinct. But that flavor used to be the flavor of bananas. So that actually is a flavor in nature. And I had never, ever, ever smelt or tasted until I had that thing. And I, don't, I wouldn't say it was good because I'm not a big banana Laffy Taffy person. But if you are, then you need to get uh, Kutichi. So my, my friend um, who was there, he, he loved them. Like he had never had artificial, he was Brazilian. So he would just eat, he was eating handfuls of them. And they were a little small, one, one or two seeds, just like a can of style, same consistency, but banana Laffy Taffy, craziest thing. 
um, the flavors. So this is my little outdoor grow tent. And so I have these uh, cherimoyas and atomoyas, which I grow outdoors um, all season. They do fine. And they're all in pots. Nothing is in the ground. Everything fruits in pots. And I trim them back because I'm not growing fruit for the entire neighborhood. Just growing because I don't know, I can't eat more than one anona a night, but I can probably eat one a day. But so I don't, that's about how many I grow for me and my family. Um, and then I have this little cheap grow tent. The only problem is, is this year, the, the top did get holes in the winter. So I did have to, so don't buy that. So don't buy these yet. So I'm still figuring out um, a cheap way, but those are only a hundred bucks. So for one winter, it did its job. I didn't need a um, heater and everything that was inside stayed fine. I have, um, that's the Musa, I don't know, one of those tropical variegated bananas that aren't supposed to grow. Did fine in a, in a tent without a heat. Um, I have cacao growing in there and figs stayed. This is December when I took these pictures. This was for the other. So this was all growing in December still. It's still they tap in the heat. And then uh, this the outside pictures and just uh, inside of the pictures. And then this is my VIP tent. So I got this idea from the marijuana growers of the world. They got some pretty good products out there right now. Um, that we can now convert to growing trees. So this is just, I think it's like a four by six little grow tent. And then I have two grow lights in there. Um, and this was in December. And I, these trees are now almost, oh, I should have took a picture. I'm just a middle school teacher today. So I was kind of <laughs> running a little crazy, but they're all halfway up the, up the, up the thing now. So th these are just a little 200 watt, $50 LED lights. That's the other thing is trees don't need a whole lot of lights until they start to fruit. Um, in the jungle, when you're in the Amazon, the only light that gets down is the path. So if you're walking along a, a path, you get light, but if you take one step off, it's dense jungle. There's no light that gets to the bottom. So these trees are used to growing in low light conditions until one tree falls down. And in the Amazon, that happens a lot. And it's, I mean, it's scary when you hear these trees just fall down, like all day long, these trees, huge trees are just falling down. But they, and then once that falls down, then that tree hits the light and then it sprouts. And it, then they're all fighting for that light. But they're used to growing. And some of these even grow, uh, can fruit, even in these low light conditions, like clavia, cacao can, I, I've seen cacao fruiting in jungles where there's no light. Um, so, I think, um, at, especially at a youngling stage, I don't know what I'm going to do when they get bigger. Um, it's a pretty big house, so I'm hoping we could find some, some more room for my wife. But for now, um, it serves it serves its needs. Um, and I'm not traveling anymore. I'm back teaching. So there's not a whole lot. I mean, as far as trying to find, you know, people always ask me, you know, uh, is, there, is there anything else out there? Not Not commercially. Really, there's... I've, I've been all throughout South America, I've been with the fruit hunters. And if it's, there's not really much left to find that could be commercially viable. There might be a gem or two, um, but it's all, it's here now, right? So now you just got to learn how to grow it and fruit it. Um, and a lot of these, the Eugenias can fruit in two to three years. So um, those in the Campomanesias can fruit in two to three years. So we'll start to get these flavors um, and spreading around the SoCal area. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, we'll get more people interested in collecting some of these uh, before they're gone, because literally these some of these will be gone unless we go and collect them and we have a market for them. Right. So collecting these and having these um, these guys go out there, the Brazilians, they, they will do a lot for a very little amount of money. They will go in and save all these for us. But we got to have a market for it for them. Um, they're good people, but they need to live, too. All right, so we have a couple, um, there's a couple of seed sellers out there now who are, who are helping um, provide that market. Uh, and hopefully I, I, you know, I gave a little doorway into that and uh, can build a little bridge uh, between the two communities. I think that's it. All right, any questions? Yes. So the question is, is um, 
So it depends. So Brazil is a it, Brazil is a very 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 big country. So you have the northern part, which is along the equator, which is Amazon. You have the center part, which is Cerrado, which is called high desert area. And there's also trying to grow things from there. There's also what we call the Cerrado curse, trying to grow things from the Cerrado. If you've ever known, if you don't grow it in pure sand, it's not going to live. Uh, that's the secret. So um, if you grow things from there. Uh, and then once you hit Brasilia, that's when it starts to get a little bit cold. So it's just the things that, I, that we look for. Uh, it, in, a, in the U.S., I mean, besides Hawaii and Southern Florida, we live in Southern California. It's the frost that, that, that really hurts everything. So you have to protect against the cold temperatures. You can grow everything here with a little bit of help. Uh, you just have to protect against the cold. This is why also a lot of the things I'm looking for will fruit in pots. I'm looking to grow these things, um, not necessarily put them in the ground. You, I mean, you can. I've seen a lot of people put Suriname cherries in. I grow a lot. Most of my Jaboda cabbage are in the ground in my front yard, but also the ability to put them in pots. And should a frost come, to put my stuff in the, the garage and a little heater to just protect them uh, is not out of the norm either. Yes, ma'am. And you put them in uh, like sand and, and just pure uh, soil. What do you use for fertilizer? So what I do use for fertilizer is so fertilizer. I just, so the backyard I use Osmocote, which is chemical fertilizer. So it's not organic because I have dogs. In the front yard, I use the organic Dr. Goods, whatever. So you and that you can just put as much as you want. The Osmocote, you have to be, you have to monitor it because you can burn the roots. So the the only difference is is the fertilizer, the the organic fertilizer, that needs the bacteria to break it down. So it's just the stuff before it becomes stuff that plants can drink. So the way plants feed is they drink, right? So the it the the molecules have to dissolve in water and then it flips across the roots membrane with the help of a sugar molecule. So it needs that sugar to allow the, the, the absor absorption of the chemical across the gradient. So um, so in order to grow, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, well, I was wondering if you had specific brands. So, I, okay, so that's the other thing is it's mostly marketing. There is no best for citrus. Like if, if you ever look at, if you ever look at fertilizers, just look at it. 12, 6, 7 is not going to be much different than 12, 7, 6. And if you look at the back and you look at the ingredients, they're all the same. Okay, they're just marketing to you. They're just saying, this is the best for citrus and this is the best for roses. And it's all the same. It's roots, uh, it, the, it, if it's the organic stuff is bone meal or, or something like that. And then the bacteria breaks it down into phosphates and, and then that dissolves and then the water brings it down to the roots. So if you use Osmocote, which is a chemical, um, which is like the extended release, which I use in my backyard because my dogs would dig up everything if they didn't. Um, then you have to monitor how much you put. If you, if in the front yard, I just, it smells horrible, but that stuff you can just put as much as you want and just let it organic. But then also I don't fertilize as much anymore because um, my yard is full of mulch. So I get the, I get free mulch in El Segundo. I, not around the tree. So you have a little buffer between your, your bark and then you put stone or I use pumice. The, the red rock is beautiful stuff. And then right outside where the tree drips, that's where you want to start your, your, your mulch line, okay? Because that's where the nutrients, that's what's going to break down. And I, we have put a lot of mulch in my yard. But if you do that, you don't need to fertilize. Yes. Okay. I don't know what this is. Zoom. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so I... So the way that I germinate seeds is different than I don't just put them in a pot and pray. So I clean them and then I put them in sphagnum peat moss 
So the really good stuff, not the, the cheap stuff from Canada. You have to get the stuff from New Zealand that is actually peat moss because it has a chemical. It produces a chemical that does that fights off mold and fungus. And then I spray with neem oil and then I just observe. And then I have it on a heat mat so it never gets below 75. And I have, a, I have two tables like this in my house and with heat mats and then these drilled little germination tanks. Um, he's, he's seen them, but he's been in my house. So, and I just... You just, as long as they don't dry, and then you do the float test, and they're they still sink. Some, some if you know some, that's not true for all seeds, um, but if you know they sink and they and they sink, then they're still viable. So I do test them, I do clean them, I do inspect them, and I don't give up until either they crack or and something happens or a mold takes a hold and it's just beyond beyond recovery. So yeah. <laughs> Folks, because the reason I use biochar is charcoal. So the one thing that sand doesn't do well, not silt or clay, but sand doesn't do well is hold minerals. This is why it, leads, it doesn't hold. So if you hold biochar, what that is, is that's pure carbon and that acts as a sponge for your nutrients. So it just it's just like a sponge for nutrients that traps it in. So I always add that biochar in. Um, and, and my sandy mixtures, and then, I, then you don't have to fertilize as much because then your roots will find those traps. Yeah. No. Yes. Um, thanks for mentioning the soil. I'm cheating. I have another microphone. You got it. <laughs> thanks for uh, mentioning Gary and his soils. He kind of saved me for a lot of my potted plants. But my issue was always at what point do I up pot versus root prune versus rejuvenate or refresh so i mean what's how do you go about it do you cut back so i i heavily prune my anything that's starting to get big and then if my theory is if you grow in in inorganic material inert material so the stuff that doesn't break down then your roots will never get root bound because they're always going to be pushing against pumice, which has air holes, which will allow the air and the nutrients to get through. So if you're growing it in that medium, then you're just waiting for the roots to come out the bottom and then you trim. And if you keep the tree at the height that it's, that it's balanced, um, then you don't really need to up pot. So I'm experimenting right now with figs, I think 15 gallons, Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some that are getting pretty thick and I'm getting nervous. But again, I, I'm, I, I, until, until we do it, I don't know. So my answer is, my good guess, if you have good potting material, you don't have to up, up pot as much because there's no way for that root to get root bound. So I do for my seedlings that I grow indoors, for anything outdoors, I don't because I think what Gary said is it's you're breathing it in all right. It's all it's already in the air. So whatever's it's the spores. It's all especially after good rain. It's it's already there. So just let nature do its course. Um, the seedlings that I do have because the sand that I do I clean it and I bleach it just because I, well, I get it from the beach off the dunes by the beach. So I get mine for free. Um, but I do clean it and bleach it and then I put the good mycorrhizae right back in there just in case. But I think it might be a little bit over engineering. But again, I'm human, so I kind of want to over engineer things too. Yes, sir. So this is where I, so when people come to my house, I tell them, and or even today, pick a group you want to go down the rabbit hole because pollination is species specific, right? So anonas, yeah, yeah you got to, there's no other way. You got to get out the, the, the paintbrush and things, but eugenias are self-pollinating. Um, if you got bees and bugs around, they're fine. Jabotacabas, I've never had to pollinate and I have, they're all fruiting and flowering in my front yard. Merciarias, the, the general rule of thumb is that you need a couple to cross-pollinate uh, you have one, it will take a lot longer for some strange reason. I don't know. I don't know if that's anecdotal. I don't know the science behind that. I uh, couldn't tell you. But uh, all the other ones, it seems like one needs to be enough. Me, I always grow three of things. 
uh, until I until I know. Um, but I know Jabotacabas, they can self-pollinate from just fine. Yes, ma'am. 25 gallons. I have uh, two huge Inga trees and all my cherimoyas are in 25 gallons. Um, I don't think I needed to go bigger than that because if you keep it, again, if you're, if you're chopping leaves off, then you're not sending roots to, to, you're not sending energy to the roots and they're not gonna get root bound. So keep pruning heavy, right? If you're, if you're just growing for yourself, if you're going to throw fruit away, prune it back. If at the end of the day, there's fruit rotting on the ground, prune it back because you're just, you're wasting, you're, you're creating more problems for yourself in the long run. That's the big question. So Jabotacabas, yes, because I got I got these multi grafted cool trees. So yes, Eugenias, we don't know yet. Suriname cherries, there's now varieties. So there's a dark one and a red one and an orange one, even a nude one. Um, so those are the varieties, but I don't know if you can cross graft yet. Um, very specific because again, a lot of these. None of these, none of those have, have been fruited in the United States yet. There's so any of the Eugenias I have there, this is the this last year we found it. So yes. You don't need a whole lot. You don't need a whole lot. So a cup per five gallons. That I buy online. Um not charcoal, make sure, the reason I say biochar, because if I say charcoal or activated charcoal, then people go buy like briquettes and then that's full of oil and petroleum. And the, so biochar is just pure charcoal. It's just activated, it's just activated carbon, um, which allows it to soak the material. You don't need a whole lot because sand will do most of it. You just need to give sand a little bit of help because it does leach water. Every, every time you water will leach some of those just biochar or agricultural charcoal. Uh, aquarium charcoal will work just fine. Same stuff, exact same stuff. Aquarium charcoal, it's activated charcoal. I mean, you're gonna, if it costs more for biochar, then that's marketing. It's, it's the same stuff. We'll go here and there. Yes. 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 If you're going to go to the store, the cheapest stuff is the 397 quick creek, quick wash. It even says for agricultural products, 397 for a 50 pound bag. <laughs> That's, I mean, if I didn't live in El Segundo next to June, I'd probably just go buy that. So it's very cheap. It's um, the sand. If, if you go to Home Depot, it's 397. It's the, in the quick creek, um, quick wash sand. Uh, and then to make that, the, the only thing is, is that you, it, if you want to make it lighter, then it costs more. So sand is super cheap, even free, really. But if you want to make it lighter, then you have to add either perlite, which is the cheapest. But the problem with perlite is if you, if you, it's not very structurally sound. So if you crush it, it becomes um, silt or becomes clay, very, very fine particles, which makes me nervous. So pumice would be the thing that I would go to. To, to first lighten up. Um, if you have money, then rice hulls, they make dams. I think um, in Japan, they made dams out of rice hulls that are still there for like 75 years. They don't degrade. So that would be another one. And vermiculite. Um, vermiculite has aluminum. Uh, so there's some theories that that won't work as well as a growing medium, but I don't know. It seems to do fine for me so far, but I do kind of test it right now. I don't really I don't really know yet, so I don't really want to say vermiculite. Um, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, so Laguna Hills Nursery would have biochar. And I know he puts that in his, um, I'm not, man, I'm not Gary's salesman, but his Gary's top pot, right? He puts some of that in there with his peat moss, but it's I, I'm pretty sure it's sand and pumice is the is the main ingredients. All right. Yes. Uh, 
Can you just sign me over? I need to get this. Okay, keep the flower. Plenty of vines just started to come flat. Okay, so which yellow? You have plenty of edulis, plenty of clausa, Mercearia glazaviana. It's Mercearia glazaviana. Okay, so yeah, you have a Mercearia. So sandy, sandy, sandy. Um, they do, so Mercearias do throw a tap root. So you need to put it in a, in a deeper pot to let that tap root go down. Other than that, the same growing material as you would uh, your Plinius, which is, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah, there and the, the, those once you once once you get them in good growing, if you have them in peat moss. So my theory on peat moss is that the, it's so acidic that stuff can grow in it. That's why it's okay for a while. Like none of the bad fungus can grow in it, so it's good for a while, and then all of a sudden it starts to break down, and then that's when you get problems, right? Yes. Uh, okay, so grow bags. I used to love them, but then. I find that in Southern California, it's too, uh, the humidity is too dry. So they act as a wick to wick water away from your roots. So I've gone back to plastic and it seems like I don't have to water as much. And it seems like the water is now going to my plants instead of two. Now in my green, uh, in my grow house, in my greenhouses, I do grow, have three figs, three or four figs in grow bags just to keep the humidity up. So there's a couple that I do, but I water those more. And you can see it definitely dries out way faster. So I don't suggest them for Southern California. Maybe if you lived in a high humidity area like Florida, um, they would do better for you. But here, I'd get nervous about having to water too much. You would really have to water a lot because it's a fabric. So it's literally wicking water away from your soil. Uh, well, terracotta pots can hold the moisture within, but also say in theory, Similar theory, but they're also much thicker, so it would take a lot, a lot more water. But yes, same in theory. Yes, yes, sir. Oh man! Oh yeah! Oh my God! Okay, I promise you, I have killed more plants than probably all of you combined. I have tried to grow it all. Um, there are some like durian, man, that one, and duguedia before I figured out sand was the main ingredient. I killed a lot of duguedias, uh, and that one hurts because you wait a year for it to germinate. You spend $50 on one seed, and then you get it to germinate, and then it dies from, oh, that one hurts. Um, but lately, they've been doing really well, sand, I mean... I've only been doing that for about a year and a half now. And there's actually a Grimal back there that you need to look at. So I used to grow, I have it in the top. I used to in the, the peat moss. And then you put it in sand and you should see the new leaves. It's like twice as big. It, I mean, if that doesn't give you proof right there, there's one Grimal back there. I didn't sell it yet because I wanted to show everybody. But I grew it in the peat moss uh, and the peat moss and perlite, really airy, you know, with the, the, the medium. And then... It, it did okay, and then I put it in that, and now the leaves are twice as big. But, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, Mangaba, Hornicopia, Speciosa, I can't get to grow. Uh, Mama Cadella, which is like this just orange chewing gum, I can't get to grow here. Uh, there's a couple of things, yeah. Uh, and then uh, a lot of stuff from the Amazon. So there was one called Perebia guaniensis. Oh man, if we could get that one. That was the most inter weirdest, interesting fruit. And then I germinated them and they just did not like the cold. I mean, they got to 50 and it was gone. So, yeah. None of these will throw suckers or be invasive. They're all bushy, slow, small growing. Um, yeah, yeah. Especially the Jabota Cabas, they don't throw suckers. I don't. I don't think they. It's one single. It's a single trunk tree. Um, very beautiful tree. Uh, 
All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. That's all.